Okay, so we are continuing our discussion of some standard norm spaces and Banach spaces. So, previously we looked at the completeness of uh, R to the N with Euclidean norm, and C to the N, we've looked at uh, uniform limits of continuous functions being continuous, and we've shown that the continuous real-valued functions on the unit interval are complete with the uniform norm. But there's a claim here we haven't mentioned, um, which is that if you put the wrong norm on the continuous functions here, you tend to end up incomplete. Now, there's a question on this question sheet about this. Um, it's on question sheet 9, but I thought... Uh, sorry, it's question 9 on question sheet 3. We don't have 9 question sheets. Question 9 on sheet 3, um, which says that if you put the L1 norm, which is the one norm, the sort of area metric on the real value continuous functions on the unit interval, you get something incomplete. Now, there are actually several different ways to do this, and I thought we could maybe discuss that, though perhaps, and not have a full proof, but let me leave some details for you, and then you can fill it in, for example, using the hint on the question sheet. So let's have a look at the uh, incompleteness. And uh, let me move right to the end of all those proofs we had before. Aren't there a lot of them? Uh, right, so where were we? We wanted... Uh, the incompleteness, if you use norm 1. So, so we're doing CR of naught 1 with the norm, norm 1. So that's norm of a function is the integral between naught and 1 of modulus of f of x dx. And we claim that this norm, and so this norm space, is incomplete. So this norm space is incomplete. How do you prove that a norm space is not complete. What do you have to do? You have to use the definition of completeness somehow. So, what would one? What would you try to do? Well, I'd start from antithesis. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Okay, so you suppose it's complete and then you get some sort of contradiction. Yes. You can do it that way, but... Yes? yes? Defined, of course, you want that, that That's exactly what you want. You, this is, if you're going to work directly from the definition, you're going to have to try and find a Cauchy sequence that doesn't converge. So that means... Well, that's, in a way, that's quite nice, because it means you're going to try and find some particular, very concrete sequence of functions which somehow does something odd. Now, the sequences we looked at last time almost, but don't quite, help. So, so I, can, I can think of two completely different ways to do this, two different ways to think of an interesting sequence. Can anybody um, think of something that might be an interesting sequence with some interesting properties? It doesn't have to solve the problem straight away but it's some, some sort of sequence that we could discuss. You have to be careful because you must make... You, this Cauchy sequence you try mustn't be uniformly convergent because if you're uniformly convergent, you will converge with respect to norm 1. So you're going to have to find some other sort of sequence that <coughs> is Cauchy with this norm 1. It doesn't converge uniformly. It could converge point-wise, perhaps. So you could look for a sequence that converges point-wise but not uniformly and see if you could use that. 
And we did have an example of that last time. Okay, so if you take a moving spike, um, so let's have a let's have some possible sequences to look at. Um, so we're looking for. Cauchy sequence in CR01 using norm 1, which does not converge in this space. Of course, it turns out to converge in the bigger space, namely called L1, which is well known to be complete with the L1 norm. So, uh, so it does converge in a somewhat bigger space, but it, it won't converge with respect to norm 1 to, to a continuous function. Now, so I think even when they don't solve the problem straight away, it's still worth looking at some interesting sequences. So there's a suggestion here of a, of a moving spike sequence. Let's see what happens with there. It might not work, this one. Let's see if we can fix it. So the moving spike sequences... Uh, sorry, let's have that there. Moving spike sequences of functions, they are functions that tend to look something like this, go along for a bit, up and maybe down a bit, maybe, or possibly the spike may come all the way down to the origin. And the spikes have got varying heights, maybe, and varying widths, and they go nearer and nearer to the origin. So you could have another one that might go in a bit further, be very thin, go higher, this sort of thing. Um, this is a typical sort of moving spike sequence of functions. So um, you could try... a sequence of functions... with spikes of possibly varying heights, if you want, um, getting thinner and approaching zero, and then turn to infinity. Um, Zero in uh, width. <laughs> okay. Well, if you do that, and you're trying to get them to be L1 Cauchy, you're probably going to need to get the area of these spikes tending to zero. There may be a way around it, though. Um, but the most obvious thing to do is to, let the, is to get the areas of these spikes, uh, of the triangles to tend to zero. Otherwise, you have to try and make the areas of the overlaps be very small, but that's difficult if they're going to get thinner and move to the origin, because you're going to sort of lose the overlap after a while. And if the areas of these triangles actually does tend to zero, what's going to happen? As far as L1 convergence is concerned. So let me say, however, if the areas of these triangles or areas of these spikes tend to zero and then tend to infinity, what can you tell me about these functions Fn? They actually will converge in, in L1. Which function will they converge to? They'll converge to the zero function. Because it's the area metric that matters. 
So, and I don't know whether you can fix that or not, um, but I, I, not in the usual way of using moving spikes that I know of. But I mean, do you know of a way to fix it? Yeah, I, I, I suspect that that one doesn't work, at least not easily. Though I, I know a slight variant of it that will. Um, any other interesting sequences of functions that, that you know of that might be worth thinking about? Okay, the X to the M ones are quite interesting. They almost work, and you can fix them. Um, so the sequence X to the M from last time is interesting. You see, it tends to a discontinuous function point-wise. So that sounds promising. Because it sounds like, okay, it's tending to a discontinuous function point-wise, so how can it possibly converge in L1 to a continuous function? But unfortunately, it can. But unfortunately, Fn tends to zero with respect to norm one. Let's have a look at that. Here's y equals x to the n. And what's that area? The integral between 0 and 1 of modulus of x to the n dx. It's already positive, of course. It's unfortunately equal to 1 over n plus 1 which tends to zero as n to the infinity. So although it converges point-wise to a discontinuous function, it actually converges with respect to area to the continuous function that's constantly zero. But you can fix it. What you can do, you can fix it by uh, sort of doing something like that on just half of the interval and making the function constant on the other half. The, re the only reason you get away with this is that the discontinuity happens at just one point and it just doesn't count at all from the area. So you might as well just move that point down and fix it, make a continuous function. And when you just move one value down to make a continuous function, it doesn't change the area. So to prevent yourself doing that, you can fix it by doing something like this, by going to a half instead and doing some functions very like the ones we had before, but then going off at constant 1 like this. So it's not to scale anymore. Now, who can suggest some functions that might do this. y equals fn of x this time. So let's try to fix it. Um, who can suggest uh, a definition for some functions that look a bit like this, based on the x to the n idea, but making the, uh, you know, keeping it constantly 1 from half up to 1? So obviously we're going to have try fn of x equals um, 1 if a half is less than or equal to x is less than or equal to 1. Oops, what have I done there? A half less than or equal to x less than or equal to 1. And um, if x is between 0 and a half, I want to do something like that x to the n behavior, still... Um, ensuring that you are converging pointwise to this discontinuous function. So what, what are you going to go for? Uh, 
2 x to the power n. That will do. OK, then this works. You can show that this is Cauchy. You can show that there's no escape this time. It converges pointwise to this thing that's zero for a while and one for a while, and you can't fix it. You know, you can't just move one point down because you still left all the other stuff up. Um, there's some stuff to check. So details to check. One is that Fn is Cauchy with respect to norm one, so I can just say norm one Cauchy. Um, Fn converges pointwise to the discontinuous function. f of x is uh, naught. Oh, sorry. Well, OK. The way I've done it here, I guess it's uh, to be consistent. 1 if uh, half is less than to x less than to 1. And naught if naught is smaller than equal to x is smaller than a half. Can't have a contradiction at a half. But that's not yet conclusive, because we've seen before that you could converge pointwise to a discontinuous function, and yet still converge with respect to norm 1 to some continuous function. So your final part is to show that there is no continuous function no continuous function g um, OK, in CR01, <laughs> so that norm Fn minus G1 tends to 0 as n tends to infinity. So that last bit needs a bit of work, but you can do it. And there's a hint there for the details is uh, C sheet 3, question 9. Anyone need uh, me to go back, sorry, on these slides? Is there anything you didn't get, anyone? Or did you get everything written down? OK. Let me give you an, a completely different way of doing it. There, you had a sequence that did converge pointwise to something. There's another way to do it. We have a sequence that doesn't converge pointwise to something. And let's see. Uh, Alternatively, you can base your sequence on the unbounded but integrable function. So the unbounded function y equals 1 over root x. 1 over root x is this rather peculiar th function that tends to infinity the tends to the origin, but where the area under it is finite. Now, obviously, that is not in CR01. Apart from anything else, it's not defined at the origin. What you can do is you can truncate it at a particular place. So what you could do... Um, it's not going to be to scale, is it? OK, it's not to scale, as usual. Now, it goes up something like this. What you could do is you could truncate it at the point 1 over n, and that's uh, root n here. And you can go along horizontally. So you could try. Fn of x equals 
1 over root x if um, 1 over n is less root of x, less root of 1. And uh, root n if 0 is small or equal to x is small or equal to 1 over n. And if you look at that sequence, you could also show that it's L1 Cauchy, um, but um, there's no hope, of that, uh, no hope at all of that converging in norm 1 to a continuous function. But uh, again, details to check. So this works for different reasons, but you can check the details. Right, well, of course we didn't do all the details, but any questions about what we've been looking at today? I've given you two plausible sequences to think about. Um, well, we've come up with two plausible sequences to think about. You can look at their properties, you can investigate whether or not you get uh, that they're Cauchy, you can, you can establish they don't converge with respect to norm 1 to a continuous function. Though, of course, they're guaranteed to converge with respect to norm 1 to an L1 function. Um, so if you know about the, the Banach space L1, you know that these Cauchy sequences will converge in there, and you can even figure out which function they're converging to. Uh, right. If you know a lot about L1, you can actually use what you know about L1 to help you prove the bit about not converging to a continuous function as well. Right, OK, I think we've spent a long time on those two slides. It's time to move on. So you've got some norm space, and you've got a linear subspace or a vector subspace. Then, of course, you can restrict your norm to that subspace. We'll often use the same notation for both, which is really abusive notation. But, you know, I've already done that in, in the sense that the norm 1 is, nor is used for this norm on the continuous functions, but it's also used for the norm on the L1 functions. And norm infinity is used for the, this norm on the continuous functions. It's also used for the norm on bounded functions. Um, so we often will use the same notation for a norm on a big space and on some subspace when we're using the restricted norm. Now, you may remember about metric spaces and the subspace metric. Well, of course, this is like the subspace metric. So anything we know about subspace metrics, we can apply to vector subspaces with a restricted norm. So you've got a norm space, and you've got a linear subspace, and you restrict the norm to f. If you're complete, well, that's saying you're complete with the subspace metric. Because, I mean, it is the subspace metric. When you restrict the norm you, and see which metric you get, it's exactly the subspace metric. So uh, it's a restriction of the metric. So um, if you're complete, we know that complete implies closed. So... Complete subspaces are also closed subspaces um, in that way around. Closed doesn't imply complete in general because the result we have about closed subsets of metric spaces is that if your original metric space is complete, then a closed subset of it will be complete when you restrict the metric. So if he's a Banach space, then you get every closed subspace of it is a Banach space with a restricted norm. So 
since we're usually, and unless we say otherwise, we'll normally put the restricted um, norm on the subspace. So we'll normally say, suppose you've got a, a norm space, and suppose this is a closed linear subspace of it, and so on. And then, and then we assume it's a Banach space, or, or, or we assume it's got the restricted norm, and so on. And then you get this sort of thing. Every complete linear subspace of a norm space is closed. Complete meaning with a restricted norm. And every closed subspace of a Banach space is a Banach space with a restricted norm. And so if you've got a Banach space, then a, then a linear subspace is closed if and only if it's complete with a restricted norm. Any questions about uh, norms on subspaces? OK. Here's another example, then. Once continuously differentiable functions from naught 1 to R. Differentiable functions whose derivative is continuous. Well, we know that you can add derivatives and so on. Um, this is definitely a linear subspace of the continuous functions, but it's not closed. Actually, it turns out to be dense. Since you will see later that it's dense, I'm not quite sure we'll actually ever prove that in the module. Um, if, you, if we don't actually prove that it's dense, then um, you can find out about the stone weierstrass theorem, which I don't think we're going to have time for in this module. Um, so I'm, I don't think that's quite right. Well... Probably not time, but you can find out about the stone weierstrass theorem. Stone weierstrass theorem tells you that quite frequently subalgebras are dense in the real continuous functions, and, and this is a typical example. Um, you can multiply these functions together, they're still continuously differentiable. And there's enough, enough of them there, you've got the constants, you separate the points, and stone weierstrass tells you that that's already enough and you will be dense in the real continuous valued functions. So it's a, an instant consequence of the stone weierstrass theorem. On the other hand, you can also use the Weierstrass approximation theorem, that polynomial approximation, that, or um, I mean, there's some stuff. There's a lot of different ways to tackle this one. Okay, so it's not. It's since it's dense, and since it isn't everything, it's definitely not closed. That means it's not going to be complete with the usual norm. Now you can actually, uh, again, go ahead and prove it's not closed directly by finding a sequence in there that converges uniformly. And when I say not closed, I mean not uniformly closed. So it's not closed in, with respect to the norm infinity. Um, it's not complete. And since CR01 with norm infinity was complete, that's going to stop it being closed as well. Um, not closed, so in fact you can find an explicit sequence of functions in there that converge uniformly to something that's not in there. In other words, a sequence of differentiable functions that converges uniformly to a function that's not... Well, OK, continuously differentiable functions that converge uniformly to something that's not continuously differentiable. And I wonder, just wonder, whether we can think of such a sequence straight away before we go on. Um, so for a start, who knows a continuous function that isn't differentiable? On the unit interval. Yeah? Uh, Weierstrass function. Okay. Weierstrass function is a very extreme function that is not differentiable anywhere at all. But it will be hard to work with. Yeah. Okay? But it's, it's a good example, the Weierstrass function. However, let's try and let's try and think of an easier one. The E sub minus one of ret squared ones, they're the ones that are incredibly flat, but they are differentiable everywhere with continuous derivative and derivatives all zero, usually. Yeah. All right. 
Oh, okay. Well, the, the, what? Yeah, sure, all sorts of fractal things. But can, let's, try, let's try and find a function that's really easy to work with. Um, okay, you need a spike. So what's the easiest function you can think of that's continuous and has got a spike in it? Absolute value is good. However, we can't use absolute value on naught one because, unfortunately, the absolute value spike is, is caused by the negative one. So we're going to have to shift it a bit because otherwise we won't see the spike. Um, so we can't quite use the absolute value. So we better use absolute value of x minus a half or something like that. Otherwise, because otherwise the absolute value of x is just equal to x on this interval. So let's use, let's have a look at that. So that, this is uh, going to come further down. Consider f of x equals modulus of x minus a half. This is in the continuous functions, but it's not differentiable at all, let alone continuously differentiable. Um, is that my notation? Let me just check again. Yes, CR1 and 0, 1. Um, so it's continuous, but not continuously differentiable. But the interesting thing is how easy it is to make that spike go away. So let's have a look at that function. Let's see if I can put some colour in for once, because I've been lazy today on my colour. So we can have black axes, but oh, I've gone grey. That'll do. Um, yes, it's true. But I wanted to. I, what I wanted to use colour for the uh, so I guess this is. Uh, doing very well. Never mind. This is uh, y equals f of x equals modulus of x minus a half. It's got a spike. It's not differentiable at a half. Any suggestions as to how I could find something that's close to that, uniformly close to that, but which actually is continuously differentiable? So it's very easy to do. You can, you can just move it off around a half, and there's loads of different ways to do that. So you could just smooth it off. You need, to, you'd, you need to do a bit of curve fitting to do it. So you could just smooth it off like this, nearby. You don't even have to get down to zero. But you do have to match up your curve. So you, could, so you, can, you can smooth. off the curve by uh, fitting a suitable, you can even do it with a quadratic parabola. I think you can do it with a parabola to make it fit. You can check what you need to fit. Um, near to a half. If, if a parabola won't do it, then do something else. However, I can think of another way of doing it, where you, that would require you to define your function. It's the same function when you're away from a half and slightly modified when you're near a half. That's absolutely fine, and that works very well. And you can then uniformly approximate your function as close as you like by a function that looks like that. Um, any other suggestions? For one, you can, actually do it this you can actually do it with one explicit formula to make the spike go away, interestingly. Any suggestions? 
Oh, you couldn't quite do it. Sine x to the power x, did you say? Yeah. You can buy it continuously. You can define it to a certain value for that function. And then it's all continuous. Oh, I see. OK, but I mean, this is already continuous. It's just it's not differentiable. That's exactly what I was going to suggest. OK? You can get that spike to go away just by raising it to a power, a tiny, any power you like that's bigger than 1. And it immediately becomes continuously differentiable. It's very, very close to being continuously differentiable already. If only you, the problem is that it, you just need to come into zero slightly faster than you are at the moment. It's, it's at the limits. It's coming in linearly to zero, and that's what spoils it. If it comes in like any power of x to zero, you'll be fine. Uh, uh, bigger than one. So you can just fix it by saying, so if you set fn of x is equal to mod x minus a half raised to the power 1 plus 1 over n, tiny bit more than 1, it, all, it becomes smooth. OK, you get to differentiate it once continuously. You can't, you can't do it again. Uh, you can't differentiate it twice, but, uh, but you can differentiate it once and it's still continuous. At that point, it starts to look like x to the 1 over n, which, as you know, when you differentiate again, you get x to the minus n minus 1 over n, which is blowing up at the point. But uh, you get one derivative, OK. Um, so fn primed of x is equal to plus or minus, and you can figure out which one it is, um, 1 plus 1 over n, it varies depending on which side you are of a half, um, mod x minus a half to the 1 over n, uh, depending on whether x is bigger than half or less than a half. And it's still continuous. OK, I didn't give you the details there. It, as I say, it's... it's it's plus that if you're to the right of a half. It's minus that if you're to the left of a half. It tends to zero as you approach a half. So the two bits fit together. And it's nice. Um, and you can check that Fn tends to F uniformly. On naught one. As n tends to infinity. Needs a little bit of thought to get that, but it's not too bad. OK, so that's uh, a uniform limit of continuously differentiable functions, which is not continuously differentiable anymore. So what that tells you is that the uniform norm is the wrong norm for this, this vector space. But it does, it is a com it's got a com nice complete norm on. Um, it's just not the uniform norm. What you have to do is take the uniform norm of the function and add the uniform norm of the derivative. And that's a different norm. And that one is complete. Uh, any more questions about that example before, before we move on to that? So here is how you fix it. It's a different norm. Um, you put the uniform norm of the function and you take the uniform norm of the derivative. Remember, the derivative is continuous, so the derivative has got a uniform norm as well. It's got to be bounded. Um, it's good. And you can just use the usual norm infinity of the derivative because that's still a continuous function. And then you get a Banach space um, with this norm. And to prove that the Banach space is quite easy once you prove the following lemma. Um, if you've got a sequence of functions in this space, and suppose that the functions converge uniformly to one thing, and the derivatives converge uniformly to something else. It's no, not obvious that there's any connection between those two things. And in fact, if you go on to more, if you work on a fractal instead of on naught one, you can, you can get really weird behavior. You can get 
the functions tend to something, and the derivatives tend to something completely unrelated to it. Um, so, but not one is nice, and it doesn't happen there. It, to it so happens that if the functions tend to something uniformly and the derivatives converge uniformly to something else, the something else really is the derivative of the first function. Which is interesting because, as we know, on, on first look at it, you don't even know that the uniform limit of the functions is going to be differentiable. So the content of this is, not only is that function f differentiable, but that limit of the derivatives is indeed the derivative of it. And so it's continuously differentiable. And we won't have time to prove that right now. You might want to think about why that's true. It's a, it's a consequence of the fundamental theorem of calculus is one of the ways to prove that. Um, so it's, it's really a really nice thing about uh, integrals of uniform limits converging to the right thing. But before I uh, come back and prove that, here's a little exercise for you. Every vector space over RLC can be given some sort of norm. This is actually a consequence of the fact that you can form Hamel basis. So you take any vector space, you use Zorn's lemma, or you quote the fact that it's standard that you can find some vector space basis for it using a Hamel basis. Uh, that's Zorn's lemma to show that they exist, otherwise you're not sure you can do it. Once you've got that, you've got a Hamel basis, it's quite easy to find all sorts of different norms in terms of the Hamel basis. Um, but not every vector space can be given a complete norm. And as I mentioned before, if you take a vector space which is countably infinite dimensional, then it turns out there's no way to put a complete norm on it. So this one we're just looking at here, the first norm you tried didn't work, it was incomplete. Then you try a different norm and it turns out to be complete. But some vector spaces are worse than that. If their dimension is countably infinite, then uh, no matter which norm you try, even though there's loads of different norms you can try, none of them turn out to be complete. So when I finish filling in a few more details, we'll have finished this section 3.1 at last. Uh, any questions about what we've done so far? If not, we'll stop there for today.